Great. Well, we have a, um, a good number of uh, attendees on, so I will uh, I will start and uh, and uh, tell you how the webinar will work, and then introduce our speakers. Uh, first, my name is Graham Pugh. Uh, I've been supporting the Zero Carbon Buildings for All uh, initiative uh, for WRI and working with uh, partners and many of you on the call uh, to help make this initiative a success. With that, what I would like to do is, um, again, welcome everyone to the webinar and I'll introduce uh, the speakers. We have four speakers from um, partner organizations that have really uh, stepped up and uh, raised the level of ambition uh, and in attempting to uh, bring this initiative to the fore uh, at the UN Climate Action Summit. Uh, the first speaker is going to be uh, Emma Stewart, who I think um, many of you who have been involved in this uh, will know has been um, the lead organizer. Emma is the uh, Director of Urban Efficiency and Climate at the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities, where she leads um, WRI's global work on urban efficiency and climate and finance. She uh, has a background in buildings uh, from the private sector, working with Autodesk and is a member of the board of the U.S. Green Building Council and has brought that expertise uh, admirably to this initiative. That will be followed by Victoria Burroughs, who is the director of the Advancing Net Zero Initiative of the World Green Building Council. She oversees that, uh, that project um, as well as the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment. This was a, a very much a path-breaking um, effort to bring attention to zero carbon buildings uh, upon which we're, we're building in, in this initiative. Uh, Victoria has a background in, uh, in sustainable development, um, advising clients and uh, working with green building rating tools. Um, so we are very happy to have uh, Victoria and of course have uh, WGBC as a, as a valued partner. Then we'll be joined by Umid Saberi, and uh, Umid is from uh, the International Finance Corporation, IFC. He's a senior industry specialist on green buildings, and he is the global technical lead for the EDGE Green Building Certification, which is, um, has, has also been uh, a great way to focus attention on um, this, uh, this important uh, means of evaluating the um, potential of uh, buildings or the actuality, the implementation uh, of, of buildings to, uh, to achieve uh, net zero. Um, he uh, has worked extensively with private sector, um, the Climate Smart Investment, of course, from IFC and advised numerous property development projects uh, around the world. Uh, and last but not least, we have Elizabeth Wangeti Chege, and Elizabeth is the uh, chair of the Kenya Green Building Society and uh, a, um, has been a valued uh, advisor to the uh, Kenya government throughout this, uh, throughout this process, and I think has really been the one who has uh, uh, shepherded um, Kenya's uh, participation and their commitment to, to this initiative. Uh, Elizabeth um, was the CEO and co-founder of a uh, sustainable construction consultancy and has really been the leader in the transformation of the built environment in Kenya. So we're extremely happy that uh, Elizabeth uh, is here and happy that Kenya is, uh, is a country that has uh, committed to this initiative. So with that, I think I will hand it to Emma to uh, begin. And um, you can see the agenda. Emma will provide an overview of the initiative and then we'll have uh, statements uh, with uh, the perspective of the other three speakers. So I'll pass to you, Emma. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning, good evening all. Um, I'll start off with the bad news. The buildings and construction sector is one of the biggest climate culprits known to humanity. Uh, in fact, the operation of buildings alone represents roughly 28% of global CO2 emissions. That, for perspective, is more than the entire transportation sector. And in addition, because buildings are long-lived assets, averaging 40 to 100 years in life, their emissions are effectively locked in post-construction for longer than most vehicles, most power plants even, or other forms of heavy infrastructure. Now the good news. 
Upgrading the energy performance in buildings is one of the cheapest ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, is feasible through a combination of existing policy mechanisms, and provides multiple health and human benefits to their occupants and to their neighbors. In fact, the International Energy Agency recently found that pairing energy efficiency with clean electricity, the two key ingredients to a zero carbon building, could cut 87% of building emissions by 2050 with existing widely available technology. So that puts well within reach today what climate science tells us is necessary to stabilize the climate by mid-century. Just to hammer home this point of all the emissions reductions available to us through 2030, buildings represent by far the largest source of low cost reductions. Roughly the equivalent of agriculture, industry, energy supply, and forestry combined. So if you're interested in tackling climate change, buildings are the single most cost-effective place to start, making them particularly important for the developing world. What's troubling is that the headwinds have intensified. Because of the growing need for floor space around the world, emissions from buildings are set to double by 2050 rather than to drop. This is because despite gains in energy efficiency, the sheer growth in demand for buildings is outstripping those gains. It would be like if you chose to jog on a treadmill, but the treadmill was set to sprinter speed. We are effectively falling off the back. This means that those who track climate progress, like Mission 2020, single out buildings as one of the sectors falling farthest behind. This confronts us with an enigma. The single best means to fight climate change cheaply while improving human health and productivity is the same sector lagging the pack on climate action. So what's needed? It's evident that this sector needs a shot in the arm. We need heightened ambition to decarbonize the building stock by mid-century as the climate science dictates. And we need broader awareness that zero carbon buildings are viable, flexible, and affordable. Now, since this is a relatively young subject matter, let's talk definitions for a moment. The good news is that being young, front runner organizations like World Green Building Council and the IFC have managed to already harmonize their proposed definitions of zero carbon buildings. In essence, a building or a set of buildings qualify as zero net carbon by reducing and offsetting 100% of their operational emissions. They do so through a combination of energy efficiency, on and or off-site renewable energy, and where absolutely necessary, high quality, certified, and preferably local offsets. IFC goes one step further by encouraging building owners to achieve at least 40% of that via energy efficiency and insist that any buildings using offsets recertify more frequently than those met wholly via on-site renewables. This graphic shows the order of operations recommended, starting with optimized levels of energy efficiency before renewables, on-site renewables before off-site, and renewables before carbon offsets. Now, please note that the Zero Carbon Buildings for All initiative currently focuses on operational emissions, but our founding partner, World Green Building Council, has launched groundbreaking work on embodied emissions that will inform this initiative, and those countries interested in expanding their commitment further upstream into the supply chain can do so. Because Zero Carbon Buildings have already been proven feasible, feasible technologically in multiple markets and in climates, WRI uh, has a research report called Accelerating Building Decarbonization, which provides numerous examples from Kenya, Mexico, China, and India. So what's been missing is the political ambition and appropriate policy pathways to drive market change. Enter the UN Secretary General. In the spring of 2019, he laid down the gauntlet to those of us in the climate change field to support national governments in producing concrete, realistic, but ambitious plans to bring the world to net zero emissions by 2050. WRI was honored to be asked by the Secretary General to lead this charge, but quickly recruited front runner organizations like those listed here, each of which brings a unique set of strengths to the challenge. Over the course of five months, a 20 page detailed proposal was assembled. One example of a front runner is the UN's global ABC program, which seeks to foster national political ambition for greener buildings 
via policy dialogues and regional roadmaps, and is therefore critically important foundation laying work to this initiative. While PEEB and IFC bring world-class expertise on financing instruments to remove the many obstacles to unlocking working capital. Entitled Zero Carbon Buildings for All, intended to convey that such buildings are not exclusively the domain of technologically advanced or wealthy countries, this multi-partner initiative will realize heightened ambition by leveraging the combined leadership of government, industry, and civil society to drive policy ambition and implementation via financing. More than a campaign or declaration, it is designed as a multi-country, multi-year, multi-partner initiative with funding to provide free assistance to governments ready to commit to decarbonizing their building stock by 2050. Specifically, the initiative is composed of two parts, drive national ambition via enabling policies, and secondly, drive implementation via financing. To receive support, national governments are invited to commit to zero carbon new buildings by 2030 and existing buildings by 2050. For ratifiers of the Paris Agreement, this increased ambition should be reflected in their 2020 NDCs as well as in their domestic policies. Based on years of experience of the founding partners, we encourage vertical synchronization between national and subnational governments in order to jointly drive change most effectively. But technical assistance clearly is not enough. Financing for zero carbon building projects, both new construction and retrofits, must be mobilized from public and private finance institutions alike. When banks sign on to this initiative, they commit to a collective goal of $1 trillion by 2030, aligned with Paris compliant or zero carbon buildings projects. They also commit to incorporate preferential loan conditions for such projects. In a very good sign in just two to three months, Numerous multilateral development banks have already stepped up to signal their support for the initiative and to offer their technical expertise to signatory countries and cities. It seems that a shot in the arm is already starting to galvanize people. Thanks to our partnership of organizations, momentum is growing even before the initiative officially launches. In just three months over the summer and on a shoestring outreach budget, we were able to garner declarations of support from four multilateral banks, plus the International Finance Corporation, and the private sector of the World Bank. Three national governments of major economies in Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe, with more actively considering their participation. Four building technology companies, the world's largest architecture firm, and the World Economic Forum, the largest network of CEOs and heads of state. We invite governments, financial institutions, and corporations or design firms to commit each in different and concrete ways. National governments commit by signing statements of intent to plan and execute zero carbon building policy road mapping processes, while city governments are invited to sign on to World GBC's advancing net zero commitments. Financial institutions commit by providing expert input and technical assistance to policy roadmaps to unlock flows of finance with an aim of hitting the $1 trillion mark by 2030. And corporations and firms commit by providing expert input and creating effective frameworks for cost-effective industry change. Corporations that themselves own a lot of real estate can also commit to decarbonize their buildings via the World GBC commitments. What support will governments receive? Countries that sign on will receive philanthropically funded technical support on national policy roadmaps and action plans from a network of local and international experts, including, but not limited to, World Resources Institute, World Green Building Council, Global ABC, the International Finance Corporation, the Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings, the World Economic Forum, and the signatory financial institutions. Philanthropic funds have already been identified and a portion of the overall budget secured. We'd love for you to get involved and join this international collaboration on the ground floor. You can go to this website, Zero Carbon Buildings for All, for more information, or contact the partnership via this email address. With that, I'd like to hand it over to our partners at World Green Building Council, represented by Victoria Burroughs. 
Thank you, Emma, and thank you to the World Resources Institute for inviting us to participate in this working group to bring net zero carbon buildings into the agenda for the United Nations Climate Action Summit. And also the expression of recognition in the work that we have completed already in this space and including the commitment, commitment as a signatory pathway. So I'd like to explain a little bit to you about the net zero carbon buildings commitment. The commitment was launched last year at the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco as a mechanism or a platform to both recognize and inspire action towards net zero carbon buildings at scale. That leadership action that will set an advanced trajectory ahead of the 2050 goals. So actually signatories to the commitment sign up to their portfolios being net zero carbon, both new and existing buildings by 2030. So that represents a leadership position for action at scale, that large scale response that we desperately need in order to meet the goals that Emma outlined so nicely. Cities and national, cities, subnational governments and national governments can also sign up to the commitment through initiating and implementing regulations and non-regulatory frameworks for new buildings to operate at net zero carbon from 2030 and all buildings to operate at net zero carbon by 2050. The World Green Building Council set this framework as very outcome focused. So we set the goal as achieving net zero carbon emissions across that scale. How you achieve that goal will depend on the organization or the government that is signing up to create bespoke roadmaps to achieving net zero emissions that can be verified, the progress towards achieving that goal verified through various green building rating tools, for example, or through third party carbon accounting. And a really strong component of the commitment is about influencing others, it's the advocacy piece to help inspire both up and down the supply chain, broader and wider carbon emission reductions through the supply chain. We currently have 53 signatories to the commitment. We are due to announce more companies that are signing up during Climate Week in New York and also new cities that are signing up to the commitment at the, the Mayor's Summit in Copenhagen with C40. Um, and that includes the state of California, who is our most recent state and region that signed up uh, just earlier this year. We have a detailed guidance document that sets out the requirements for the commitment, but it is more like guidance. It kind of gives guidance on best practice approaches to all the key components of the commitment, including prioritizing energy efficiency to reduce energy demand, best practice approaches to generating and procuring renewable energy, and also standards for offsets that should be used as a last resort. We leverage the work of our Green Building Council network across 70 countries and 37,000 member organizations and also their rating tools to help demonstrate action towards the commitments being set. And then we also have action plans for each organization that is signing up to the commitment or each government. Then they create these action plans to show that it is a commitment to act and implement a strategy towards achieving net zero emissions. Our theory of change is that three core players within the market, government sector, businesses and NGOs can work together and foster further and faster action towards achieving our goals of net zero carbon and that that would inspire the outcomes from market necessary to facilitate this market transformation. So, for example, inspiring innovative solutions, developing skills and capacity, creating new jobs, boosting the economy creating deeply energy efficient buildings and a decarbonized energy grid and ultimately the mass delivery of net zero carbon buildings. So after a company, an organization or a government signs up to our commitment, that's just actually the first step is the commit part is to set the target date by which you want to achieve net zero emissions against that advanced trajectory that I mentioned. The second component is disclosure. So understanding what your current consumption is from an energy point of view and also your carbon emissions profile so that you can identify potential savings throughout the portfolio and then develop and implement a carbon roadmap that outlines the key actions and milestones needed to achieve the net zero goal that has been set and verification is really important to understand where you are along that roadmap to achieve those ultimate targets to demonstrate enhanced energy performance reduced carbon emissions 
and progress towards a net zero carbon assets and portfolio. And then finally, that advocacy piece, which is whether you're a design firm and you're looking at the projects that you're designing, or whether you're a manufacturer and the projects and the, and the products that you're creating, demonstrating leadership to support the transition towards net zero carbon buildings. So thank you again to WRI for welcoming this commitment as a way forward for this initiative to help support and inform decisions for responsible investment and emission reduction. And so I'll now hand off to Omid from the IFC. This is Omid Samiri. I'm a green building specialist from uh, IFC. We are the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Uh, we have been working with World Bank, World Green Building Council since, since uh, last five, six years on green buildings and uh, with WRI on the initiative for zero, zero carbon um, around the world. So very quickly to give you an update of where we are with our program on, on zero carbon buildings. World Bank has uh, been uh, working on several layers of trying to introduce green buildings around the world. Uh, one of the ways that we are looking at uh, the green buildings and zero carbon buildings is coming up with uh, business as well as investment opportunities and bringing the banking sector to the game. And that's really, really important for us to enable financing that can be diverted towards uh, green buildings and zero carbon buildings. And that's really important to enable central banks as well as local um, country banks to, to support these initiatives. We published reports on uh, investment opportunities and we will continue. We are going to publish another report this fall for COP24 to explain our position on, on green buildings and zero, building, uh, zero carbon buildings. Uh, the way that we are tackling the market is uh, from multi-prong, um, so working with the uh, investment and policy services for the banks, um, because we really believe that banks can play a big, big role in in this. We also offer edge certification, a certification system that enables even low-income housing or low-income projects to uh, get certified and recognized. And through the edge certification, we are introducing zero carbon certification as well. Um, we also do other investments, direct investments with our clients. We already have clients, our IFC clients, that they are committed to become zero carbon by 2030. Also, we do incentives and codes with governments to ensure that they can direct those incentives towards a greener um, movement in the buildings, uh, building sector. EDGE program looks at three elements. We uh, offer a free online application that people they can use to verify their projects. And our app already have a zero carbon built into the app and, and projects can verify the, the status with, uh, with our application. We set up a minimum standard of 20% saving and there's a certification network that they uh, provide uh, certification, third party verification around the world. Uh, the certification partners that we have already, um, they are spread all around the world. And if you see that we have um, in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America, and uh, we are very excited to see that the, the momentum is building up um, rapidly towards zero carbon. We already have clients uh, in Philippines and Eastern Europe that they they want to certify with, with zero uh, carbon and we are like, hold on, we will certify you very soon. So we, we want to be able to bring them on and uh, possibly this fall to announce it uh, through our uh, announcements uh, and, and seminars that we have. Uh, the way that we do uh, deal with, with certification is not only for high-end buildings, we try to bring, uh, you know, this is a social housing uh, in Argentina that was certified and uh, runs a lot on solar and we want to bring these kind of low income and affordable homes also to the game to enable the scale, uh, global scale. What we are doing on Zero Carbon uh, next week on Monday, on, uh, the 16th, we are going to announce um, with an email to all our uh, users and customers our approach to Zero Carbon building. Uh, we will be 
having another webinar uh, along with uh, the event that is happening in the in New York on September 26 um, to inform all our users and the webinar will be open for all uh, to um, to mention exactly the process that we are um, providing with World Green Building Councils and others how we are tackling green uh, zero carbon buildings. As Emma previously mentioned, we have we set the 40% saving as the minimum saving on site, and then the rest of the offset can happen by offsite uh, renewable energy or by car by carbon offsets. Uh, that's our, our process. Uh, we are hoping that we can bring all the players together as we are here to, uh, on this call to be able to move the market to uh, zero carbon buildings by 2030 for new buildings and by 2050 for all existing buildings as well as new buildings. Um, watch out for our reports that are coming out uh, this fall and we would we would continue working together. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I'm going to hand it over to my dear friend Elizabeth um, and our, our colleague there in Kenya. Hello, thank you, Omid. I'm now looking at, um, it's Elizabeth Chege here, and I'm now looking at um, what uh, net zero carbon buildings are and what it means uh, to Kenya. So I'll take this opportunity to, to take a, a step back and celebrate, uh, especially under this initiative, that we have uh, the definition that um, we can actually use uh, for the initiative. Uh, because that was one of the things that we realized uh, was creating uh, a bit of slowness to get, especially in Kenya and the region, uh, the countries on board and the different institutions on board towards zero carbon buildings. Um, the first initial thoughts were it was very foreign until we looked at the Kenya grid first of all, and I'm sharing this slide to show that with net zero carbon building portfolio or net zero carbon district, we start looking at what the energy uh, grid has for uh, from Kenya. And at the moment, there's 90% dispatched uh, renewable energy into the grid. So by looking at this definition, we quickly saw that there's no reason uh, for Kenya not to come on board onto the initiative. And there's been very strong interest. And also you might be aware that Kenya on the big four agenda that was set up by our president, one of the aspects is affordable housing. So I'll concentrate more on affordable housing and low cost housing towards also having zero carbon buildings. And thank you to Omid for um, showing that uh, edge can also be used for such buildings because it's one of the things we've been advocating for. So just a note at, at the bottom of that uh, slide, you'll see embedded carbon is not included in the zero carbon buildings for all commitment but can be included by governments. So that is definitely one of the things that Kenya is also looking at and will be responding to. Another item just as a, a place setting on this is that um, Kenya has a deficit of 2 million houses in total. Every year we have an additional 200,000 deficit added to that. So we've seen an opportunity to have a, a drastic uh, buildup of housing, and of, this is a great opportunity to have them as net zero carbon buildings. Another aspect to note is that the climate in Kenya allows for uh, passive design and the opportunity here with having the portfolio or district net zero carbon allows for designers to step back and look at spatial planning that will enhance uh, net zero carbon buildings from the passive uh, element and then we look at our at our source of energy which is highly uh, from renewable sources and also we move on to education on use of energy. Uh, lastly I'd like to mention uh, that there's a promise of building 500,000 houses with 100,000 of those going to um, for uh, affordable housing, low-cost housing or most vulnerable house um, uh, people in the urban centers. Now, uh, another item I'd like to mention on this slide is that Kenya pronounced its first national housing policy in 2004, which recognized the adoption and promotion of environmentally friendly building materials and technologies. So already many years back, the, uh, a lot of the uh, place setting policies uh, were in place. 
However, um, we haven't seen a lot of take up and this initiative gives a, a fantastic opportunity to slingshot forward in these discussions. Uh, we'll have quite a few more people, 100 million more people who will be um, urban poor uh, due to climate change. So the view from Kenya is looking at this affordable housing and actually responding to that and providing zero carbon uh, affordable housing on that basis. So my focus today will be how we actually communicate and have ease of use of what energy is being used in these buildings, because that's the definition of zero carbon in this situation. So for example, here, we've got um, an image from a typical house. This is actually from uh, South Africa, because we're in close coordination with the country as well. And this is actually available on an, a smartphone. And what we note that is that the people actually using the building and using the electricity note how good the energy use is and from what sources. And by doing this, what Kenya is trying to do is actually showcase that even if we have zero carbon buildings, we still have to have the, the human behavior element attached to it, especially when we're talking about uh, 500,000 additional houses uh, to be built. So more of the panel title, and I'd like to highlight some of uh, some of the uh, power used here. So um, I'd like to highlight the stove element um, in Kenya. We're looking at actually um, uh, the electricity used in buildings, uh, especially the houses. We've noted that energy consumption in in, uh, in the houses has been increasing. So um, the opportunity is on the research side of uh, things. Uh, we know also noted that a lot of the fossil fuel use was actually in uh, or used in uh, cooking, for example, um, and this links to human behavior. So the opportunity here that um, the Ministry of Energy saw was to actually get people back onto electric use of cooking. And this is where we saw the urgency to have a way of monitoring. Um, and especially that uh, we, if we have the 90% renewable energy connected to the homes and we put people back onto electric cooking, then we need to monitor how, um, how energy is used. Uh, the gates are there uh, that's uh, indicated. Uh, there's a law that has been passed in Kenya that uh, solar hot water must be used in the houses. Um, and uh, we're now phasing out the use of electricity but at the same time, we've seen, um, even in industrial uh, buildings, that um, the use of the gases um, has to be captured. So uh, for the policies that are created, there's a national policy, and now we're moving on to uh, the county policies as well, uh, which will be contextualized by the use of energy. And this is such a screen that is also made available for uh, the uh, use of the energy itself. Another way with that we would like to show here in Kenya is the easy uh, to access and confirm opportunity. So um, on a daily basis, uh, we have an opportunity to actually um, showcase uh, the users of the buildings, uh, how they're using the power. This might sound um, quite, um, quite basic at the point of discussing zero carbon buildings, but it's one thing we've realized that to move the masses to the zero carbon buildings, we need to go back and actually communicate and educate. And by empowering the people with such technology in their hands, then there's greater opportunity to actually realize the true uh, zero carbon buildings with energy efficiency use. Um, because we've also seen that human behavior um, allows people to actually um, uh, think that because they have renewable energy or they're zero carbon, they can use a little bit more uh, power. So that's one of the works we're doing. We're linking this, and this slide here shows that um, Kenya is linking this to the initiative that for the Climate Action Summit, which is building the climate resilience of the urban poor. And one of the main uh, components and outcomes is actually human settlements, which we are linking to uh, this uh, zero carbon building initiative. Um, and lastly, I'd like to add that um, education, capacity building, research is necessary uh, towards this initiative, and we look forward to supporting it um, uh, throughout the Climate Action Summit and beyond. Thank you very much. 
So I'd like to uh, pass on to back to Emma uh, to take over the screen and um, close us out. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, very much. And thank you also to Victoria and to Omid for joining us today. As you can tell, um, this is uh, a, a significant collective effort um, and one that uh, we've been very pleased um, to work in uh, with multiple chefs in the same kitchen, um, cooking the same recipe uh, and have great hopes for the future and how we will jointly implement um, in the various parts of the world uh, that we see most in need and where the political will um, is sufficient to, to uh, step up and work with us. With that, I'll turn it over to Shannon, who is curating um, and running our Q&A uh, to invite uh, a number of questions from the audience today. I want to start just by reiterating something and maybe starting off with the most obvious follow on, which is um, probably to Emma, which is, you know, um, for an organization or company thinking um, about whether or not this initiative is right for them, where would you suggest they start? Um, can you say anything more about next steps and um, who and what kinds of organizations the initiative is, is intended for? Of course. So this will be launched officially at the UN Climate Action Summit hosted by the Secretary General. Um, but we are uh, happy to field interest before then. Uh, as I noted, we have a number of signatories already. Um, and then, of course, those that have signed on to the Advancing Net Zero Commitment via World Green Building Council. Um, so the, uh, the commitment is open to national governments, uh, city and corporate entities, uh, again, via the World Green Building Council. Financial institutions, those can be public, uh, multilateral institutions. Those can also be private banks. Um, and as I noted, each uh, statement of intent, depending upon the nature of your entity, uh, is slightly different as to what we ask of you. And I would point you to the website um, that goes into a bit more detail on that and also includes a link to the commitment language so that you can um, choose to, to sign on the dotted line. Uh, though in some instances, uh, we would recommend a back and forth uh, with your entity and our initiative. Uh, and some of that commitment language is uh, malleable if need be. We have uh, found that for ministries within certain uh, countries uh, or for certain financial institutions, there's a request to slightly amend the commitment language, um, uh, either for purely legal reasons uh, or linguistic reasons uh, or more substantive reasons. So we invite a back and forth um, with our partnership in order to ensure that you can sign on and feel comfortable with um, delivering on your commitments. Thanks, Emma. Um, great. The next question um, that I want to direct is to probably would make sense to start, let's say, perhaps with Elizabeth, but I think it, it makes sense for every <laughs> panelist to answer it as you see fit which is a question around how does everyone envision uh, their zero carbon buildings work developing in terms of global engagement? Will Are there thoughts around COP26? Um, what will the future of representing zero carbon buildings look like? Obviously, we, the plans are not fully in place yet, but um, if anyone would like to say anything about, about that aspect and how this will continue to be featured at, at global events in the future. Hi, I'll take, I'll take the first question. Thank you very much. Um, um, the way we envision it is definitely because uh, the Climate Action Summit links to NDC enhancement. So the opportunity with this work is to actually have um, um, an urban observatory uh, so that we have opportunity to do research on baseline data from buildings um, and look for opportunity towards further research so that we can uh, enhance uh, our National Climate Action Plan um, on the human settlements, the buildings um, as well. That's one of the aspects. And also we are as, uh, speaking on behalf of Kenya Green Building Society, which is a chapter of the World Green Building Council, is input towards uh, Green Buildings Day as well, so that we can start capturing data that we can share 
on um, the amount of uh, carbon uh, mitigated and also um, enhance on the opportunity of any any carbon mitigated uh, through uh, the buildings, the materials as well, and not just stop at um, energy efficiency use, it's also how we construct the buildings. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Would anyone um, else like to weigh in on the global engagement question? Happy Victoria and I'll made for you to do so. This is Emma. I'll just chime in um, uh, to, to add to Elizabeth's excellent response, which is um, the implementation phase, which will be multiple years of support um, for those uh, committing to the initiative. Uh, we'll have a number of um, uh, in-person meetings where we will try to piggyback on existing events, uh, COPs being a wonderful example. And to Elizabeth's point, the next ratchet of NDCs in 2020 um, is a prime opportunity window uh, for this initiative to showcase what uh, the building sector can do to elevate the level of ambition within 2020 NDCs. And so we're open to working with those who sign on in running quantitative analyses to see what is, what is feasible um, in terms of aggregate emission reductions from the building sector for their country uh, in order for them to gain the confidence to, to write that into their NDCs as we work in parallel with them on formulating and shaping the domestic policies that they'll want to put into place to ensure that those NDC commitments are met. So long story short, we will be um, at a number of, of these events, likely hosting uh, meetings on the side, uh, in addition to hosting, of course, workshops and trainings, capacity building events uh, within the countries that have committed. Uh, so this is all me. I, I, I may just add a few, a few simple elements to this. Um, you know, through our events at the World Bank and IFC, we, we do engage with multiple stakeholders, um, uh, you know, governments. You know, recently, we had a commitment from the finance ministers of around 70 countries um, to climate um, climate action. And what we are trying to do, trying to bring uh, buildings uh, more and more to their attention, as well as zero carbon buildings. And we also working with the banking networks, global banking networks, as well as a global alliance for building and construction. Uh, so in different forums, we are uh, bringing this up and whenever we, t we talk about buildings to, bring, to um, enable a higher collaboration and higher understanding of our member countries, as well as the private sector. For us, the private sector is, is really important. And the interesting thing is that we see much higher interest from private sector than from government. And we, we see the private sector is moving um, with much more ambitious plans and targets. And that's really encouraging uh, because they set the, the uh, good examples in every, every country and help others to follow. I stop here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would. This is Victoria from Wellcoming Building Council. I would really second that. I think the the private sector has all the tools in their armory to deliver net zero carbon buildings. Now, um, you know, we know what the technical solutions are, and we're seeing the buildings pop up all over the world. And so, the secret to unlocking that potential is now to trigger that demand through regulation and policy, and sort of really raise that ambition level. But I think. You know, we're all agreed and hopefully, as, as Emma says, we can see in the future more being incorporated into the NDCs around this dramatic shift to building to much higher standards of energy efficiency and access to renewable energy. You know, those as real fundamental principles in this challenge will really help us go a long way. And so particularly using events and platforms like COP, like the Global Climate, like the UN Climate Action Summit um, and all the various events, industry sector events that are happening um, over the next few months and the next few years, that will be a really important platform to help communicate this ambition and ensure that people are more comfortable with elevating those and taking further action. Thank you all. That was a great set of answers. Um, the next one is perhaps a little bit more challenging, um, and maybe we can start with Victoria or Emma on this, since I know that um, it's been an ongoing conversation. But can you say a little bit more about the use of offsets and how 
the initiative is is making decisions and and integrating uh, ideas around the extent to which offsets um, are part of a net zero carbon building or platform. Sure, I can perhaps go first and then hand it off to you, Victoria. This is Emma. Um, offsets are uh, uh, included in the commitment as a, a qualifying pathway um, to achieve net zero carbon buildings, districts, portfolios. Um, that's for uh, a number of reasons. Um, we do emphasize that they are um, deemed a last resort, uh, that the preferred pathway is by maximizing energy efficiency, uh, secondarily on-site renewables, uh, tertiary off-site renewables, and then uh, lastly offsets. Uh, we do anticipate that as the cost curves of things like renewables continue to improve, um, that the attractiveness of offsets will subsequently uh, decline and buildings will become less reliant on offsets if indeed they do choose to go that route. Um, we at World Resources Institute know uh, all of the pros and cons of offsets uh, quite intimately and even within our own staff uh, enjoy a healthy debate uh, on the subject. But given the uh, ambition level of this initiative, we felt that all uh, options for high quality carbon uh, reductions needed to be on the table uh, to make this achievable, especially in uh, lower income countries. So we have included it, um, but with uh, significant guidance, just as I have, IFC provides significant guidance on the nature of offsetting. Victoria? Absolutely. Uh, we, we take exactly the same approach, Emma. Um, the, the infographic that we have that kind of sets out our vision includes the principles that underpin our framework for advancing net zero that our Green Building Council has established uh, following COP21. And we took that approach to that, um, that offsets should be used as a last resort um, in some strategies to achieve net zero emissions that some organizations may be reliant on them. But we certainly don't encourage that as, as a route to compliance or to achieving a net zero emissions strategy um, in, the, in the sort of dates that we talk about, the 2030 and 2050. And as I would echo that, that market would probably drive that out as a compelling solution to a net zero strategy. And so focusing on decarbonization and decarbonizing energy grids would help reduce the need for carbon offsetting. Some of the Green Building Council programs around zero carbon buildings, such as the one in Canada, the zero carbon building program um, has a, a requirement for a zero carbon transition process or a transition plan if you do rely on fossil fuels so that your um, your reliance on offsets can be minimized sort of down the track. Um, and in some markets, they're simply not permitted under certification. So it really depends on the on the specific market. But um, but we do have some best practice guidance for that in the detailed guidance and some of the, the systems and the schemes that, that can help ensure that if offset if offsets is an option, that it's um, conducted in, in the best way possible. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll just add very quickly uh, to this note. You know, one element is that we have to have find, uh, solutions that can work in every situation and in every country and every city uh, you know being a perfectionist is good uh, you know uh, obviously the the ideal world is that every single building would be energy positive they produce enough energy and they export extra energy to the streets um, you know we have designed these buildings 10, 15 years ago, that they can even supply to the uh, to the national grid, so that grids can uh, use the the building's energy. Um, however, being idealistic uh, and not seeing the facts on the ground may not lead us to to a solution. So that's where we feel that we have to bring a solution that if you are in the center of uh, in the center of Mumbai, a high-rise building that have very limited area for renewable energy you can still try to be efficient and then try to offset your carbon with the hope that your offsetting carbon will feed into renewable energy at some point and that renewable energy can then bring back the supply to your building so that your building can run on renewable energy and is efficient and that's the that's the main goal at the end of the day and it's important to provide solutions to the clients that they can supply and uh, they can um, apply and, and make it happen. And with that mindset, 
carbon offsets while it's the last, last resort, but it needs to be there. We cannot just take it out. Um, and that's, that's our, um, our uh, thinking with World Green Building Council and uh, other partners as well. Thank you, Amid. With that, I believe we're just about at time for the webinar. So with any additional questions or to follow up from the discussion that we just had, please get in contact with us via the information on the screen. We'll also be sending a follow-up email with the presentations for everyone's reference, and we can also use that to start a conversation. So we'll also be sharing the webinar recording both online and in that follow-up email. So plenty of opportunities to continue engaging, but thank you everyone for joining us today. We're very excited to continue this conversation with you and thanks to our presenters for a great webinar.